I'm very grateful to Annie Grace and Joe and Denise and all those who have made it possible and easier for me to uh, fill in for our pastor as she recovers. We certainly are concerned and we pray for her swift recovery and for her physicians as they continue their search to discover what on earth it is that is causing her so much pain. At any rate, the second string is here again, and uh, I'll do my best to carry the ball for you. John's Gospel, chapter 15, is one of the most amazing bits of writing. And I must tell you that the passage that the uh, scholars have given us for today, John chapter 15, starting with the uh, uh, ninth verse, causes a, a great dilemma for a preacher. There are too many, too many preaching opportunities in that chapter. Too many possible texts. So one has to study it carefully and decide, okay, what shall I preach on this week? Which of those many verses shall I take? Well, what I've done is selected one verse in particular that's toward the end of the selection for today. The passage where Jesus says to his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will abide. Amazing. What a text. You did not choose me. It flies in the face of American volunteerism. We think we make all the choices, but all of a sudden we discover that there's a whole divine operation in practice here, and somebody else is making decisions for us and about us. I chose you. The Bible is a record of God choosing people. He chose Abraham and sent him out. It's never just one part. There's never just the, I got chosen. But I got chosen and I got sent. So God chose Abraham and sent him out. And then God chose Isaac and gave him an assignment. And then Jacob and Israel. God chose Joseph and sent him on an unusual mission to the Pharaoh in Egypt. And God chose Moses and sent him Go back, go back to Egypt where you're wanted for murder. Go back to Egypt and set my people free. God calls and God sends. One of my, one of my sons, my second oldest son, Dan, bless his heart, worked his way through the book that I published a couple years ago, and he had one question for me. He said, why is it that in this chapter I'm reading, you keep talking about God calling and sending? Why the call and sent? And I said, because that's what God does. God calls and God 
sins. Here in this particular passage from the Gospel of John, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go out and bear good fruit. Well, I expect if you want to define good fruit in terms of populating the world with the Christian gospel, we can say we've had a victory. We Christians in North America who long ago defined a part of our role in the church's history as that of sending missionaries to foreign countries. By the way, the more salt water, the better. We sent people to every race and nation. And today we can declare victory because the gospel is preached in every language to every people under the sun. That's really quite an achievement. But the problem with it is that, that the missionary movement has pretty well died out. The emphasis on foreign missions has nearly been dropped in church after church. You don't hear much about it anymore. You don't have these missionaries coming home to tell stories about what it was like in this particular country for them and their families to serve. So that is a success. In fact, what's really happening is that the countries to whom we sent missionaries are now sending leaders to us. The Northern Illinois Conference has recently had a bishop from Korea. Um, imagine that. The Korean church sent a bishop to the American church. How wonderful. And the president of the Council of Bishops is from China. Amazing. Well, so God gives us victories. You didn't choose me, I chose you. And I appointed you to bear good fruit. Well, what, what if we take this passage seriously, personally? What if you and I think this morning about what does it mean if Jesus is talking to me and saying to me, you didn't choose me, I chose you and appointed you to bear good fruit. It's that second part where, is where, where the hard work comes in. It's easy to accept the appointment, but difficult to carry it out. It seems to me that we have a lot to learn from the success of our missionary endeavor. Bishop Leslie Newbegin, who spent 40 years as a missionary from his church in England to India, returned home to England. After 40 years, he looked around him at the church is in England, at the situation in England, and he said, England has become a mission field. This is like India used to be. Right here. And he and others have looked at the American scene and we look around us at American culture today, and we say, it's a mission field. The United States 
is a mission field today. It's not what it used to be. We're in facing a different situation today than ever before. We're facing a situation right here in Hyde Park where the very fact that you have left your home to come to this building to worship God on a Sunday morning and hear a sermon about Jesus' instructions to his disciples, that sets you apart. You're being different. Your behavior today is unusual in this culture. Didn't used to be, but it is now. To worship publicly, to identify publicly, kind of reminds me of, a, of an elderly gentleman I had in the church I served in Wilman, Iowa years ago. He was stone deaf. He couldn't hear a thing. And yet every Sunday there he sat in the fourth pew from the front. That was his pew. Nobody else bothered him. Nobody else sat near him. He just sat there all by himself and looked as if he was paying attention, even though I could see that he was sleeping. I once asked him, in the best way I could, I said, why do you come to church when you can't hear anything? He said, I want to show them whose side I'm on. Well, that's what you're doing today. You're showing others whose side you're on. You didn't think that it was a radical act to come to church, but it is. It sets you apart. You didn't choose me. I chose you, and I have appointed you to do good works that produce lasting fruit. I sometimes wonder about how well we do the rest of the week as we attempt not only to participate in public worship and identify ourselves publicly with a worshiping congregation, but as we attempt to celebrate diversity. We do, you know, in this church. We celebrate diversity. We celebrate difference. We are what uh, some of the politicians today make fun of, ridicule, and say they're against. They don't like people like us who celebrate diversity, who think that the fact that God made so many people who are so different from each other is a good thing and want to be part of that and want to be a community that actually lives that out. Well, that's unusual today and not necessarily popular everywhere. We are woke, to use the term that the governor of Florida enjoys. We are a woke church because we celebrate the diversity God has given us. You didn't choose me, I chose you and I have appointed you to produce good fruit. Sometimes we find ourselves called to respond in responsible ways to fierce injustice that we see around us. I was, I attended the National Council of Churches Conference on Racial Justice several years ago. And when the church service began, 
uh, there was this marvelous procession of distinguished looking people coming down the aisle. First there came a, a huge choir. Oh, what a marvelous choir. Down the aisle they came with the opening hymn. And right behind them, a whole procession of clergy from a hundred denominations, at least. And the Orthodox were there with their amazing robes and hats. And the Episcopalians were there with, with their pointed hats. And the United Methodists and the Presbyterians and the Baptists and the United Church, they were all there. And the Lutherans, in all their strength and power, making a demonstration. So all these very important people walk by. I was sitting right on the aisle, or standing there, singing the hymn. And then all by herself, one little tiny lady came walking down the aisle. And I looked at her and I recognized her right away. It was Rosa Parks. The little lady who, when the driver of her bus in Montgomery, Alabama said, get up and give your seat to that white man, refused to move. She said, no. I don't think she chose to do that. I think someone else made that decision and she followed the directions. I'm not going to participate in this silly ritual anymore. I'm not going to participate in this injustice anymore. I'm just going to sit here. And the bus driver said to her, then I will call the police. And she said, go ahead. That's the lady who all by herself, following all these distinguished churchmen and their marvelous choir, came walking down the aisle at a conference on Christian pursuit of justice. Bless her heart. What a witness. Now anybody can be called. All of us are called if we choose to hear. If you have ears to hear, there is a voice speaking to you, calling you to give your life for something bigger than itself, for something really marvelous, something that abides, something that bears fruit, like this congregation, this worshiping congregation we look around and we say, we're not very powerful. We're not made up of great strength. We don't have considerable wealth among us. We don't have political clout. We're just a worshiping congregation. We come from three different traditions. We're from all sorts of backgrounds. <laughs> of course. That's our power. We are who we are because God has called us and God 
sends us to be his witnessing community in a secular world. Amen.